Thanks for the invitation. I'm very excited to be here. And uh, I'm excited to share with you this work that it's work in progress. Actually, some of you might have seen the paper. Uh, and I don't expect, of course, that you read it. It's pretty long, I understand. Um, but it is actually uh, in the phase of revise and resubmit for a journal. So I really look forward for your feedback. And also, if you have like precise issue to raise, feel free to uh, email me about that. Let me share my screen then. Um, let's see. One second. There it is. Good. So I'm going to talk about mathematical diagrams. And I'm sorry that I couldn't make it uh, to the colloquium last week for the talk of Aaron Sloman, who actually talked also about um, cognition in mathematics. Uh, but at least I had the opportunity to see the talk, uh, uh, the recorded talk later. OK, so what are mathematical diagrams? So uh, diagrams in mathematics are ubiquitous. Uh, in fact, uh, if you look at the notes, articles, and books, there are uh, a lot of diagrams. But uh, and nobody doubts that diagrams are really important in the context of discovery. So their heuristic value is never put into question. But what is put into question is rather their role in the context of justification, that is, can actually a proof include a diagram or not? Especially if we think about rigorous proof. And I've been, worked, I've been working a lot, a lot on these issues, uh, so epistemological issues, but then I realized that in fact, like we didn't know exactly what we were talking about. What are diagrams really? Uh, and I think that a problem in the literature is that there are now very many case studies uh, um, of diagrams in different branches of mathematics, uh, but sometimes they use the terminology in different ways, and there is the risk of misunderstanding. And I also noticed that sometimes some of the controversies um, risk to be terminological. And so I was thinking to try to make order uh, and propose a definition of diagrams that would allow us to uh, isolate the phenomenon that's most interesting for a philosophy of mathematical practice. That is a philosophy of mathematics that really takes seriously what mathematicians do in their daily life. Here you have a knot diagram and a commutative diagram. As you see, diagrams are very heterogeneous. Um, here I put the, the diagram that normally accompanies the very first proposition of the first book of Euclid. Uh, which tells us how to um, construct a equilateral triangle given uh, a segment. And uh, actually, in our own talk, I learned uh, with dismay that uh, Euclidean geometry is not taught anymore in school. Uh, I didn't know. I, I was definitely taught Euclidean geometry in high school and junior high, etc. But anyway, like this diagram is particularly simple. Uh, you just like start with the segment AB and then draw to circle one with center A and radius AB, one with center B. And then you select the intersection point and you construct your triangle. Then uh, we have a knot diagram, the diagram of the most simple non-trivial knot, the trifoil knot. You can imagine the lines as forming a three dimension, a curve in three dimension, and then uh, commutative diagrams. And in fact, a lot of studies in diagrams have been focused on geometric diagrams or maybe topological diagrams. But in fact, in mathematical practice, there are these other diagrams that are akin to algebraic notation in two dimension that have been neglected. And I think instead they should be taken into, into consideration as well. Uh, so my, wor my first working hypothesis is that diagrams form notational system. Um, so this hypothesis, I don't think is too restrictive. In fact, is shared by many scholars working on diagrams. For instance, Sheen has written a couple of books on diagrams used in logic, some extension of uh, Ben and Euler diagram and standing as well. 
but other scholars also implicitly assume uh, this. So I think systematic diagrams, that is diagrams that can form a notational, that do form a notational system or potentially can form a notational system are the most interesting one. And the definition I'm trying to give uh, is a definition that is supposed to be useful for a philosophy of mathematical practice. Here to uh, give a definition of standing of notational system or system of representations. So system of representations are sets of objects like sentences, diagrams, etc., each of which stand for something else. What makes for system in these sets is that the representation be a relations to each other, which correspond in useful ways to relation between the situation they stand for. So uh, diagrams that form systems are multiple diagrams of the same uh, type that have different relation with each other. Uh, so let me first talk a little bit about notational systems and why they are important in mathematics, and then I will focus on diagrams. So notations matter. In fact, uh, the study of diagram, but also the study of notations in general has been neglected in philosophy of mathematics. But recently, maybe in the last 20 years, um, there has risen a new trend called the philosophy of mathematical practice, which in fact took into consideration all these issues uh, that were before neglected and have to do really what, with what mathematicians do in their daily work. And these are epistemological issues, uh, um, epistemological and also cognitive issues. As uh, we know, Paulia, for instance, uh, his uh, work is very famous in problem solving. He said an important step in solving a problem is to choose the notation. It should be done carefully. The time we spend now on choosing the notation carefully may be repaid by the time we save later by avoiding hesitation and confusion. And everybody knows that when we try to solve problems, finding a good notation is key. Examples of notation we use uh, all the time are Hindu Arabic numerals, fraction, decimal express, expression, square roots, etc. But also Euclidean diagrams, knot diagrams, commutative diagrams, all these form notational systems and are used commonly in mathematics. Uh, to analyze a notational system, it's important to remember that we cannot solely consider its informational content, that is what we can express with a particular notational system, but rather we must take into consideration the possible manipulations that are supported. That is, those manipulations that correspond to mathematical operation. So for instance, here you have the familiar way of the multiplication uh, with Arabic numerals, and that is an operation supported uh, by that notation. And as I will show you later, with diagram is the same. So diagrams or all elements of notations are not static displays that just uh, um, give us some information, but they are really tools we use to reason. So we manipulate them in certain ways to solve mathematical problems. Um, in order to understand notational system, I have to draw the distinction between uh, enabling and constitutive features of a notation. So the constitutive perceptual feature are those who can carry information. And they are of course indexed to a particular type, uh, to a particular notational system. So for instance, in the case uh, here depicted, you have two diagrams, uh, two different diagrams, belonging to, of course, different notational system, both of which uh, are used to prove the Pythagorean theorem. And of course, here you see that uh, the second one is colorful. And in fact, the color, it's from Bern uh, edition of the first six book of uh, Euclid uh, from the 19th century. Um, the color encodes specific informations that are important. On the other hand, the color of the standard diagrams we are used to, it's totally irrelevant. It's an enabling feature because it enables us to see the diagram and use it, but it, it doesn't carry any content. And in fact, if the diagram was red instead of black, then it would be correctly interpreted as the same diagram. 
Uh, so for instance, intersection points are constitutive features of Euclidean diagrams, but not of commutative diagrams, for instance. Um, so it, of course it depends. Uh, and the specific metric property in both cases are merely in enabling. And as we will see, they um, it's not uh, by chance. In fact, they have to be merely enabling because they are not stable under uh, small perturbations. And so they would not be, it would not be possible to have a stable mathematical practice using uh, representations they are, that are unstable in this way. So the distinction between enabling and constitutive features allows us to determine the criteria of identity of the notational items. Uh, as I was saying before, if we change enabling features, we do not change the diagram itself. And uh, with this terminology, it is possible already to spell out some general constraint uh, that notational systems have to satisfy just to be notational systems. The first one is that the constitutive perceptual features are clearly identifiable. So this is because uh, of our limits of our um, visual system. Uh, the constitutive feature have to be something we can easily identify. Um, then the constitutive perceptual feature must be reproducible in the appropriate way, perhaps with certain tools. And the constitutive uses are cognitively manageable. That is, uh, um, they, they are something we can do with our like cognitive architecture, like in the case of uh, multiplication we saw, but this will hold in general for diagrams as well, for instance, uh, for not diagrams or commutative diagrams, etc. Uh, this is pretty quick. I can say more about this, or you can also ask me more uh, in the Q and A. Uh, but I guess, like one thing, I wanted to note. I was thinking, uh, listening to last week's talk by Professor Sloman, is that in a way the diagrams I am interested in are all discrete. And in fact, the idea is that even Euclidean diagrams, when we operate with them, and when we use letters, for, in for instance, in the intersection points, we discretize the diagram. Of course, they represent something continuous, but the diagram itself is discrete. And that's why I think can be used as a notational system in a stable way. Um, yeah. Okay, so let me now talk about diagrams in particular. So first of all, a caveat, uh, I think it's impossible to satisfy all our pre-theoretic intuitions of what a diagram is. In fact, uh, this might well be vague and even contradictory, so I'm not aiming to give you uh, an intuitive definition and in fact, so my aim, it's more in the spirit of a Carnap explication in which like we substitute a more confused concept for a more precise one. However, even the more precise concept I will propose uh, present borderline cases. In fact, I think there is no sharp line between diagrams and non-diagrams and some choices are gonna have to be arbitrary. But I think that we can identify two predominant features that influence our pre-theoretical judgment of what a diagram is. And that is the presence of geometric or topological elements that trigger a special form of spatiotemporal imaginations and the fact that they are two-dimensional. Let me start with the first. Uh, since I'm virtually in Germany, uh, I feel free to use a German word, Anschauen, probably mispronounced, but I mispronounce in English anyway. <laughs> um, so I think in order to understand a uh, very important class of diagrams, we have to uh, appeal to the notion of spatiotemporal intuition or imagination. And I think like the word intuition is very problematic in English because it can be translated in many different ways, like also a hunch or things like that. 
uh, and the imagination as well is vague. So I prefer to just use the German and Schaum. Um, and I think many um, diagrams and other uh, visual representation enable, enable the use of Anschauung. Uh, yes, um, visual imagination or uh, spatial temporal imagination, um, et cetera. So for instance, here I put the uh, Escher uh, drawing of the Moebius strip with some ants uh, walking on it. And it's clear that that, I don't think it's a diagram, but surely represents a mathematical object. And surely we can imagine it in space. We can um, visualize it and think, oh, what happens to the ant if I move from one side to the other? Oh, in fact, there's just one side, etc. So my first definition is this, a notational element is geometric topological. If geometrical topological perceptual features are relevant for its interpretation and enable the use of Anschau. The domain of GT representation includes all sorts of geometric illustration like the one of Escher from very clear ones to also messy sketches. So they are not necessarily forming notations. And Shaung, moreover, does not pertain to a specific mathematical field. It's not just triggered in the case of geometry, uh, but designate a way of reasoning. So in particular, when we reason about logical relations with Venn diagrams, uh, we use Anschauung as well. Uh, so this sort of visualization. And uh, here I want to make a stark contrast between what I call illustration and diagrams. Um, so illustration are representation that can trigger Anschauung, but they are not necessarily uh, encoding mathematical information in a um, stable way. And in particular, they do not necessarily satisfy to the constraint uh, I spelled out before. Here, for instance, just as a way of example, you see two different pictures of the same three-dimensional object, which is a knot. And the one on the right is clear and we can work with it. We can uh, spell out exactly what the constitutive features are. Uh, we can see the intersection points. We can reproduce it uh, maybe with a little bit of time. Uh, but instead, with the one on the left, we can't do anything. So that is um, just an illustration rather than a diagram. In order to be a diagram, some conditions have to be met. In this case, the conditions are going to be on the angle of projection of the three-dimensional object. And here, um, in our work uh, together with Valeria Giardino, we introduced the term uh, Emmy enhanced manipulative imagination to refer to a specific type of refined Anschauung or refined intuition. And the idea is that we can redeploy some of the um, cognitive abilities we developed uh, in different ways also in our interaction with concrete objects in the abstract realm of mathematics. But we do so in a very constrained way. So the manipulation that are guided by this enhanced manipulative imagination correspond to well-defined mathematical operation. And that is why it can be used, I think, rigorously in proofs. So here, uh, I give you a toy example of that. Um, you have a sequence of knot diagrams. So you start with the one in A, you can imagine it as a curve in space. And we are wondering, oh, what is the knot that's represented there? So let's try to perform some manipulation on it in a way such that the knot represented does not change. Actually, we are going to be able to prove through a series of manipulation that this knot is actually the unknot. So to give you an example, to go from diagram A to diagram B, so you imagine the knot in space, it's a, just a curve in space, and you take the, oh, I can point actually here, you take this, the middle strand, and pull it towards you, and then put it down. 
And from here, you obtain this. And here, uh, this move actually uh, can be, it corresponds to a rigorous mathematical operation. But to see that it's valid, we use this form of enhanced manipulative imagination. Uh, and that is enough exactly because this um, way of transforming knot diagrams is reliable. And were someone to ask me more detail, I could give them more details. And in particular, so you see, as I was saying before, in, in some sense, like my understanding of diagrams as elements of notation discretizes them. But this is not something that, um, uh, this is something that is, can be noted also because diagrams like this, what really matters are the intersections. And there is some information in the intersection with strand goes up, with strand goes down, et cetera. But it's pretty clear that for knot diagrams, as well as for other diagrams, we can actually associate some codes, some linguistic codes to capture all the information. So this doesn't mean uh, that diagrams are replaceable exactly because the type of reasoning that the diagrams enable is totally different compared to the type of reasoning the code enable. But nevertheless, they have this uh, uh, description. They admit such a description. So here, the second definition a GT, geometric topological diagram, is a systematic notational system whose constitutive perceptual features include geometric or topological elements that enable the use of enhanced manipulative imagination. So that was the case of knot diagrams, and here, uh, the case of Venn diagrams. And actually, so this is a definition that captures most of what people have been talking about when they talked about diagrams, and in particular, if they look at the history of mathematics. But as we know, some other diagrams that are really perhaps the most uh, present nowadays diagrams uh, are not of this kind at all. Uh, but I think it would be a mistake to neglect them. And so the idea, okay, so we have these GT diagrams, they form a uh, really important subclass of diagrams, but what about the other ones? So how can we characterize them? So one idea is to think about, oh, diagrams are two-dimensional. So the second uh, criterion I, I listed before, but how can we define two-dimensionality? It is a vague property. For instance, not, uh, there are non-diagrammatic notational items that can present a certain degree of two-dimensionality. For instance, algebraic equations or continued fractions, integrals, et cetera. So here, the symbols are also using, in a limited way, um, the two-dimensionality of the page. And what about uh, matrices and tables? And in fact, here, I think these are kind of borderline cases. I think that in the case of uh, these notational items like continued fractions, we can exclude them because although they present some degree of two-dimensionality, their reading direction is still linear, but that's not so easy for matrices. In fact, uh, already when we calculate, for instance, the determinant of a matrix, we see patterns inside. So it's not just like a linear display. Also, when we multiply matrices, we have line by columns, et cetera. So we have a different way of reading them. Um, so I think these are borderline cases. And in order to satisfy some of our um, intuition of what a diagram is, I think it could be uh, acceptable to just arbitrarily uh, exclude them. Another problem with two-dimensionality is that there are non two-dimensional representations that are geometric topological. So this is an example of Shimohima. He gave it in order to show that diagrams are not all two-dimensional. And this is a geometric representation that 
encodes the relative distances of cities from Indianapolis. And in this, it says, oh, Bloomington is closer to Indianapolis compared to Louisville by a lot, et cetera. Um, and here, some of the geometric features are relevant. So it's certainly a GT representation. Uh, and I think it's intuitive to uh, call it diagrammatic. So that's why we can't use just the two dimensionality. So to take stock here, I introduced three different types of distinctions. One is between systematic and non-systematic um, representations. And in particular, the systematic ones are the one that can form notational systems. Another one is between uh, GT or geometric topological or not. And the last one is between two dimensional or linear or three dimensional. So here's the third definition. A mathematical diagram then is a systematic notational item that is either GT or two dimensional or both. So this is my tentative definition and I think uh, that uh, geometric topological diagrams are the most prototypical one. In fact, in the, here in the representation, you see not diagrams are in the middle, in the intersection of everything. But then we can admit other type of diagrams like commutative diagrams uh, or the one proposed by Shimohima, which don't have um, one of the other characteristics so don't have both um, both the features that makes us think that our representation is a diagram that is the two-dimensionality and being geometric topological but just one uh, so one could ask okay you gave all this uh, intricate discussion about diagrams but why do we need it at all so one uh, reason is that uh, spelling out the constraint on diagrams, in particular the constraint on notation I spelled out before and modulating them in the case of diagrams can help us explain why and in virtue of what features diagrams can play a non-trivial role in proofs. And two, it helps us, it can help to resolve controversies on the role of diagrams. And finally, uh, I was wondering whether um, a taxonomy of this kind could help us also from a cognitive perspective. And uh, here, I would be open to collaboration with uh, uh, people working on uh, mathematical cognition. So with respect to the constraints, uh, basically, these are three constraints um, corresponding to the three I mentioned before, but modulated in particular for diagrams. A, it is possible for an agent with the appropriate training and the appropriate tools to reliably reproduce a diagram. Diagrams constitutive perceptual feature are easily identifiable and carry mathematical content reliably. And diagrams constitutive uses correspond to well-defined mathematical operations, like in the case of knots I showed you before. And this can be seen also an extension of Mender's famous analysis uh, for Euclidean diagrams. So Mender's has this famous paper, which circulated from 1995, then was finally, finally published in 2008, um, called the Euclidean diagrams, in which he spelled out, uh, um, he, he distinguished between what he called exact and coexact features, which basically corresponded to geometric and topological features. And he uh, explained why in Euclidean diagrams, we could not rely on geometric features, but only on topological one or coexact, exactly because they are stable under uh, slight perturbation. And so they can support a practice that is stable. Uh, so here to finish, just briefly uh, to mention a controversy in, in analysis. So you probably are familiar with the intermediate value theorem. We have a continued function. Um, domain A to B and we, uh, any point, um, for any point C between F of A and F of B, there is an X such as 
c equals f of x. And this theorem seems to be uh, really intuitive uh, looking at the diagram. So Jim Brown, for instance, says using the picture alone, we can be certain of this result if we can be certain of anything. But Brown actually considered the picture as an illustration rather than a diagram. And this seems problematic. And Jacquinta, in fact, Marcus Jacquinta contested this claim and explained that actually this uh, cannot be true because the same picture would be equally well representing a um, function on rational numbers rather than real numbers. And then the theorem wouldn't hold anymore. In fact, this theorem is a consequence of the completeness of the real numbers. Um, and so how is the picture allowing to prove such a thing? But then a different interpretation is by Azuni, who I think sees the same figure instead of as an illustration as a diagram and therefore endowed with a specific mathematical interpretation. And Azuni uh, writes, for we can certainly precisely delineate an application class of curves if we want to, everywhere smooth curves, for example. It's important to realize that the class of mathematical objects that the diagrammatic proof can be supposed to apply to is not determined on the basis of the kinds of things the diagrams appears to apply to, according to what mathematical object its figure resembles. And in fact, is something that is conventionally assigned. Uh, and therefore, it cannot be uh, simply an illustration. OK, that's all. Uh, it's just like a sketch of this longer paper. And thank you for your attention. And I'd be happy to receive any feedback. And I look forward to your, your feedback. Uh, thanks so much.